This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. It's a Wednesday morning, a rainy one here in Mumbai at least once again. And that's why there is uh, two of us here right now. Uh, Sonia will be joining us in just a bit. We're coming to you, by the way, from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. I'm Prashant. With me, my colleague, Nigel. Nigel, hi, morning. Well, uh, uh, morning, Prashant. It's a rainy day. Let's <coughs> hope uh, you know it doesn't get too heavy out here in Mumbai. But global markets, they're in a world of their own, right? Every day we wake up to positive cues, which isn't such a bad thing. But maybe a little too uh, positive or too optimistic, I guess so, in terms of global markets. Well, uh, you know, you just got to take it as, they, as it comes, right? Yeah. I mean, in terms of the queue. So let's just quickly tell our viewers uh, the, the setup in terms of uh, how things are stacked up this morning. Uh, and, you know, just a word in terms of how we closed yesterday, right? Yesterday was a quiet day. Uh, after a pretty good last Friday and Monday, uh, the market went quiet, at least on the frontline indices. There was not very much by way of action. We closed in the middle of the range in the Nifty. Uh, the Bank Nifty actually did nothing. Uh, and small caps, actually, that's the index which pulled back. I mean, actually, if you map out the small cap index amongst all other indices worldwide, actually, I think the Indian small cap space perhaps will be one of the best performing uh, areas in the world as an asset class. Uh, that index has had an incredible run. It's down just about 1%. Uh, it, uh, as I said, just took a breather. But there is no stopping the rally on Wall Street. So the Nasdaq was up once again, a strong three quarters of a percent gain. The S&P actually was up three quarters as well. So uh, shouldn't ignore that. Uh, bank earnings in the U.S. actually, that is the, that is the one reason, the big driver, which catalyzed the move, uh, you know, post afternoon. Uh, there were there were strong economic data points as well, retail sales, housing data, you know, the Atlanta Fed GDP for estimates for the second quarter. All of that also showed that the U.S. economy itself is resilient. But the catalyst last night uh, in the U.S. was bank earnings, uh, which uh, were strong. For markets here, I mean, how do you approach things? The trend is up, but within an uptrend, there could be a halt, there could be a pause, there could be some slight uh, sideways uh, price action or even a pullback. So that cannot be ruled out. Some consolidation cannot be ruled out. And especially, I mean, the fact is that this is a pre-expiry week. And historically, I mean, you, you can go back... Uh, a number of years, pre-expiry, we have seen markets kind of consolidate in an uptrend and then kind of things start to pick up uh, pick up uh, once again. Uh, so don't uh, rule that out. Supports in that context and within this framework on the Nifty comes in at 19,576. Uh, you know, we left off at uh, almost 19,750. So that's some distance away, less than 200 points, but that's quite a bit. Uh, the upside level for the Nifty would come in at uh, 19,900, I mean, targets. Uh, broadly, I mean, the indication is that eventually we'll get to that uh, 20K mount, but uh, on the way, 19,900 is the uh, first kind of uh, important level to uh, cross. Bank Nifty uh, should defend on the downside. Banks, by the way, were more vulnerable, looked more vulnerable last week, All, uh, uh, and notwithstanding the strong pullback that we saw thanks to HDFC, uh, HDFC Bank, uh, it's it's perhaps the more vulnerable of the two areas. So let's watch this space. The 61.8% retracement of the recent rise, just the last three-day rise, stands at uh, 45,066. And that's the level to uh, sort of defend. That's about 1% out from where we left off yesterday. And on the upside, yesterday's high of uh, 45,906 becomes uh, logically the resistance which the bank nifty needs to take out. Nigel. Well, uh, you know, Prashant, in the near term, at least, these flows, they're outweighing any kind of fundamentals. There'll be plenty of points out there to call for a stall of uh, this, this sort of a rally. But it seems the flows are just too strong right out there. The global queues, they're positive. But the sense you get is most of the positives are getting factored in. And maybe the global markets are getting a little bit complacent as well because we're waking up to positive queues. The Indian markets either hit a 50 or 100 points on a day-to-day -day basis. So it appears that, you know, Almost all the positives are getting factored in in the current price. The Nifty, well, it's facing resistance at around the 46,000, Nifty Bank, that is, at around the 46,000 uh, mark odd. And that could be a bit of a hurdle in the near term. Yesterday, yes, we came off the high point of the day, but the Nifty Financial Services Index, that played out the weekly expiry, and that explained why that market, in fact, the last tick was virtually at the day's low. But the Nifty Bank, has it made a double top? See, on July 4th, we went to around that, uh, you know, 40, 45,650-odd mark, and we came off those levels. 
Yesterday as well, we went all the way to around 45,900 odd and we came off close to 500 points from the top. The question is, has the Nifty Bank made a double top? And if that's the case, then the near term, there'll be a lot of resistance coming in at around this 46,000 odd mark. And a couple of cautious signs. The previous day, we had the Nifty ended higher. The VIX as well. From bombed out levels, it's crawling back. Yesterday as well, the Nifty ended mildly higher. But the VIX as well did move up a little bit. Maybe it's because of the levels were so low. That's why we're seeing a bit of an increase. But sometimes this is one of the triggers to warn you about some kind of caution out there. So we're just putting that on board. The FI as well, they are showing us the big money. And on the index futures as well, they are adding long positions. Yesterday, they added close to 4,500 contracts. And they covered some shots as well. The long positioning is at around 71% odd. Now, we've been mentioning this in the last, uh, you know, seven, eight days or so. The cautious zone with regard to the net long positions of the FIs is when it goes to more than a lakh. Currently, we're at around 96,000 net long contracts. What's that? The long positions minus the short positions. So we are a few thousand contracts away from the cautious zone. In terms of levels, what are we looking at? Well, the Nifty, since we have the highest open interest, added on the 19,600 put odd. That 19,550, 19,600 odd bark, that's the near-term support zone. Yesterday's high becomes a bit of a resistance zone. But the Nifty Bank, you know, the resistance zone will be yesterday's high as well as the 46,000 odd mark. Remember, the highest amount of open interest is added on the 45,500 call. The premium yesterday was around 500 rupees. It was even more than 500 rupees at the day's high. So that's give you a sense this 46,000 odd mark will be a bit of a level that the bears will want to defend. Has the Nifty Bank made a double top? If that's the case, the Nifty could consolidate in the near term or pull back a couple of hundred points as well. So let's see how this goes. All right. Uh, well, that's the uh, setup uh, from all perspective that you need to uh, be mindful of. Let me quickly tell you what's lined up here in the first half hour of the show before we go any further. Well, uh, markets across the globe on the flows picture. This is coming up with Cameron Brand, the VPFR Global. He's our first guest on the program. A little later, our research team will get you CNBC TV18's list of top 10 stocks for the day. At uh, 8.30, our uh, first market guest, Devin Choksi of KR Choksi, will join in with his thoughts on how things are set up, stocks and themes he'd like to bet on. Lots of earnings reactions will be in focus as well. Well, let's get you some money market views. Uh, Kunal Sudhani of Sharon Bank uh, says this morning that the U.S. retail sales and industrial production appear promising for June but failed to revive yields, that is U.S. yields. The dollar index recovered just a little bit. He says Fed bets uh, past July will be, uh, beyond July, will be watched for a clearer sense of direction. Uh, goes on to add the Chinese yuan was seen depreciating again while Brent crude prices rebounded. For the U.S. EINR, he says 81.9 should act as a support while 82.3 is a resistance. Well, let's get you the bond call of the day then. Neeraj Gambhir of Axis Bank says that the 10-year benchmark bond yield traded in a range of 7.05 to 7.12% uh, last week. He says that India June CPI came in higher than market consensus at around 4.81%. He adds that bond yields eased, largely tracking softening U.S. Treasury yields due to lower than expected U.S. CPI and PPI data. He says that short covering in India, 10-year bond further supported the easing of the yields. He expects the 10-year benchmark bond yield to trade in the range of 7 to 7.10 ahead of the FOMC meeting that's scheduled for next week. Okay, well, uh, we've got lots of uh, stock-specific action uh, coming up that we will need to track, uh, and we'll get to it in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. We're looking at stocks like Indusind Bank, Federal Bank, ICICI Lombard, Himadri Specialty, CIE Automotive, Network 18 Media, Network, TV 18 Broadcast, Amar Raja Batteries and Rallys India. These are on, uh, on our radar on the back of positive news flow. On the other side, the negative side, we've got LNT Tech, which is the only one, and that's the results reaction. Uh, it's likely to open in the red on the back of it. Okay, Cameron Brand is joining us, Director of Research at EPFR Global. Uh, Cameron, uh, great to have you back on the program here on CNBC TV 18. Thanks for joining in. You know, the last time we spoke, uh, you were uh, pointing out as to how India dedicated flows uh, uh, it flows into India dedicated funds rather uh, were some of the highest you've seen in the last many years. This was a few weeks ago. What's the latest picture? Uh, the latest picture is that those flows continue to have uh, extremely strong momentum um, among the major emerging markets country fund groups so far in July, uh, India equity funds have had by far the strongest uh, inflows, and we're seeing that spread over to the fixed income side 
dedicated India bond funds are also uh, at the top of their peer group in the uh, emerging bond fund country groups. Mm. Hi, Cameron. Good morning. Uh, so India is getting a large chunk, but what about the other emerging markets? Uh, are you seeing it spread out? Um, there's a, a, a bit of interest in Korea, and uh, some people still feel uh, that China represents a, a, a momentum play in the second half of the year, that the uh, current trickle of uh, less than compelling economic news will force policymakers' hands and that we'll see uh, increasingly strong stimulus uh, as we push in through the second half of the year. Mm. Uh, Cameroon, uh, you know, we, we've uh, spoken about it in the past. Are there already structures in the market which allow global investors to put in money into emerging markets, say Asia emerging markets, ex-Japan, ex-China? Uh, are, are, those, are those vehicles available? Um, <laughs> well, I, we obviously are very much focused on ETFs and mutual funds, um, and uh, they've stood the test of time. So uh, those remain, you know, outside uh, sophisticated institutional investors, the sort of primary channels that we see money uh, moving uh, into Indian equities. Okay. Uh, wh wh what about, I mean, you know, funds, India dedicated funds, uh, Cameroon, those are uh, because, you know, we, in terms of foreign funds, we get bulk of our flows through global emerging market funds. The country dedicated funds is a small proportion. Is that expanding in a, in a, in a structural kind of uh, way? I think it is. Um, you're perfectly right that historically, the first thing we've looked at is the, uh, the share uh, of the average global emerging market fund portfolio going to India. Uh, but certainly in the past uh, two, three months, the bulk of the flows have been going to dedicated India funds. Uh, and uh, a, the majority of that, uh, certainly 60, 70 percent are going into funds that generally have sort of a, a long term perspective. So that is something of a change from the historic patterns that we've tended to see in previous upswings. Mm. What about the other asset classes, Cameron, uh, in terms of gold? Bitcoin out of nowhere, uh, you know, jumped back this year. Uh, <laughs> yep. Is there any, anything you have on flows in both those two asset classes? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm interested that you highlight uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, there certainly seems to be an element of how quickly they forget in the current flows. Um, and... Uh, uh, one asset class I'm watching somewhat nervously is is the subgroup of financials that uh, uh, fall into the bucket, regional banks. Uh, people ha seem to have forgotten what happened back in March and early April, um, but I think the Fed has one more rate hike in it, um, and we're still seeing a lot of money uh, move into liquidity funds, which is uh, money that... Uh, uh, banks have to go out and get in the funding market at a higher cost. So uh, th those are two asset classes I'm, I'm watching, you know, perhaps a little nervously at the moment. Okay, uh, got that. And, and uh, that, uh, just to go back to uh, sort of India uh, funds, it's interesting you say that uh, a lot of money coming to India dedicated funds and bulk of it going to long-term funds, right? Not uh, it's right. not hedge funds and uh, th that variety. It's it's more long only uh, funds. Yes, yeah, yes. Hedge fund interest was very strong uh, in uh, 21 and 22, but uh, came off the boil well ahead of of the current uh, surge in money we've been seeing going into more conventional funds. And uh, you know it's kind of uh, <clears throat> visible uh, with uh, large. Uh, long only uh, sort of funds we, we see these names regularly lapping up you know large percentage equities in companies uh, including uh, you know secondary offerings ipos etc cetera, etc cetera. thanks very much cameron great to have you with us here appreciate your insights as always here you're on welcome TV. thank you well we'll take a quick commercial break here a list of top stocks to watch with our research team coming up in just a bit
Welcome back. You're tuned into Basar Morning Call. Well, if you're just joining in, the good news is that the global queues are positive, and the better news is Sonia Shanoi has joined us in the studio as well. Sonia, good to have you. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, thanks a lot. Morning, Nigel. Morning, Prashant. Morning, uh, we all love the monsoon, but if the monsoons comes, uh, a lot of other Some things challenges. like <laughs> traffic jams and all of that, and it's hard to sort of. Today, I felt like I was in an Indiana Jones movie, you know, trying to make it on time and using this road and that. But in any case, I mean, looks like it's going to be a good day for the markets as well. Uh, you know, all eyes will be on the first tick this morning, which the, all indications are that the Gift Nifty is showing a 30-point up move. But our research team is joining in to talk about many stocks. Of course, Indus and Bank is top of mind because of a very good set of numbers. Abhishek is here with us to give us the fine print. Abhishek, morning. Morning, Sonia. So it's an absolute serene results coming in from uh, Indusind Bank. The balance sheet risk is at the lowest in last uh, seven years or even more. So what has been good uh, in the results uh, over the last few quarters is that it is perhaps the only bank to see a YOY and quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth in operating profits for 10 quarters in a row. So net interest margin is at eight-year high on a quarterly basis coming in at 4.29%. The RWA or risk weight asset to advances ratio at 111% is perhaps the lowest in last seven years or even more. It used to be around 125-130 percent, uh, uh, you know, few years back. So uh, annualized slippage ratio of just 1.9 percent is perhaps the lowest in last 11 quarters and second lowest in last 16 quarters. So asset quality continues to improve. Gross NP ratio of 1.94 percent and net NP ratio of 0.58 percent are perhaps uh, one of the best that you are seeing in last 10 quarters. What has not been good in the result, which we already know from the business update is that CASA ratio has dipped below 40%, so it's the lowest uh, that you are seeing in last six years or 24 quarters. And cost to income ratio has inched up a bit to about 45.9% when compared to 44.9% in the previous quarter. In terms of PL performance, NI is ahead of our poll, while PAT is largely in line with our poll. Back to you. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for that, Abhishek. But Abhishek, you're also uh, tracking another banking name that's uh, Federal Bank. Uh, Tell us more about their fundraising plans out there. Uh, well, uh, Nigel, uh, they have had uh, IFC, uh, which will invest uh, about 959 crore into the bank via preferential allotment. So this is a preferential capital coming in uh, to the bank. So IFC will take its holding in the bank uh, to about 8.1 percent uh, post the fundraise from 4.95 percent that they had earlier. What this fund infusion does uh, in terms of mathematics is that tier one ratio will increase to 14.36 percent. It was at 12.54 percent earlier. Equity Valuation is about 3.4 percent. Net worth will increase by four and a half percent. Book value will increase by one percent to around rupees 107 per share. A federal bank may look to raise more money uh, in the coming period or in the near future as well. Back to you. Okay. Well, uh, Abhishek, thank you very much uh, for that. Now to the I think one disappointment that we had. Uh, results came right after markets closed yesterday. Rima is here to talk about LNT Technologies. Rima, hi, morning. Hi, morning. So there is a big revenue miss. Uh, the company has reported a dollar revenue growth of 9.8%. This is much lower than consensus expectations of 12, 12.5% growth. So big miss on the top line. Uh, the problem is their organic revenue growth. Remember, the company's top line has been boosted by an acquisition, SWC acquisition. But if you strip that out, organic revenue growth has come in below consensus at just 0.6% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Margins have fallen by 100 basis points to 17.2% on account of the integration costs. But at 17.2% margins, it's slightly better than what the street was anticipating. The company has held on to its full-year guidance. So they're still maintaining that they will do a 20% top-line growth, though analysts believe it could be a bit challenging given the ask rate and the soft Q1. Management says it was the delay in decision-making in Q1 which impacted uh, the revenue performance, but there has been an improvement in decision making in June and July, which is why they're hopeful and confident that Q2 will show an acceleration in growth. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. So big revenue miss coming in there, lower than expectations. The street would react to that. But let's find out how ICICI Lombard did uh, in their results. Uh, Surbi has more details on that. Surbi, over to you. 
Thanks so much for that. So when it comes to premium growth, it was pretty much in line with estimates, but the PAT was below estimates and that is largely on account of higher losses due to cyclone. So the premium saw a growth of 19% on a year-on-year -year basis. PAT was up 12% on a year-on-year -year basis. The combined ratio came in at 103.8%, but if you exclude the cyclone impact, it, uh, it stood at 102.9% versus 104.1% same time last year. The claims ratio also were a little elevated due to the cyclone, but management continues to maintain the combined, combined ratio guidance of 102% by FI25, but they also indicated the claims ratio will be a little uh, elevated due to floods in North India and that impact will be seen in Q2. So we'll watch out for that as well. Okay, all right. Thanks for that, Surbhi. And we'll also be chatting with the management of ICICI Lomba General Insurance later on in the show at 9.50 a.m. Well, let's hop across to Sonal Shri joining in to tell us about a couple of other numbers that came out. Himadri Specialty as well as uh, CIE Automotive. Sonal? Thank you so much for that. Uh, well, both of them reported strong set of numbers. Let me start with Himadri Specialty Chemicals. It was a good set. Revenues declined by 9% on a YOY basis. But if you look at the EBITDA and margins, they were, there was an expansion of around 600 basis points. Profits were up 123%. Their gross debt has also declined on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis to come in at 682 crore rupees. The company has acquired 12.8% in Sikonu Limited, which specializes in silicon anode technology, which is used for lithium-ion batteries. So this is one... Uh, of expansion that they are planning as well. If we talk about the other name, which is CIE Automotive, uh, their revenues were up 4.7%, EBITDA was up 21%, margins were higher by 300 basis points, leading to a profit growth of 60%. Those numbers were good as well. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Sonal, for that. Uh, now, let's talk about uh, earnings from the media space. Network 18 and TV 18 broadcast both reported numbers for the first quarter. Surbhi is here with details. Surbhi, morning. Morning. So it was a mixed set of numbers uh, from them. It was they showed a strong revenue growth, but the operating costs were higher, which led to uh, losses, operating losses. But operating costs were higher, driven by investment on expanding content coverage and also the distribution reach. So operating revenues were up 142 percent. TV 18's uh, operating revenues were up 26 percent. The entertainment segment was up 184 percent, and the digital was down 16 percent on a year-on-year -year basis. Operating losses on a consolidated basis came in at 84. Crores versus uh, versus 75 crores. The TV18 news losses were six crores versus a loss of four crores, and the entertainment loss was 49 crores versus a profit of 62 crores. Same time last year, the net profit was down 26 percent on a consolidated basis. Okay, thanks for that. Well, Amara Raja Batteries has been in focus for the last few days on the back of the block deal. Vivek has more details on that. He is also tracking Rallis India this morning. Vivek, good morning. Well, you know, both the stocks are on our radar on the back of, you know, large blocks that happened uh, in yesterday's trading session. You know, like we mentioned yesterday, Amara Raja, Clarios ARBL holding that held a 14% stake at the end of the June quarter. Yesterday completely exited its stake, you know, so now it's a clean-out trade. Uh, you know, some of the key buyers included Society General picking up almost 2.5% in the block deal. A BNP Paribas, you know, arbitrage fund picked up almost a percent and a half. Tata AI Life Insurance picked up over 1%. And some of the other key buyers include domestic mutual funds like Kotak Mahindra as well as Nippon India Mutual Fund. Now, coming to rallies, uh, very interesting blog deal over there. Rekha Junjunwala, you know, sold almost 4.99% stake. The entire stake was lapped up by Tata Chemicals. Uh, so, you know, post this particular stake by, by Tata Chemical in Rallis India, their stake has now increased to over 55%. Um, uh, you know, Rekha Junjunwala also sold half a percent stake, but the buyer was, you know, Ratnabali Investment. So, almost 5.04% stake sold by Rekha Junjunwala in yesterday's trading session in Rallis. Okay, we'll watch out for all of these names. Thanks a lot. Here's a quick recap of our top stocks in case you missed out on any. Of course, stock of the day could be Indusind Bank, post very good numbers. Then you have Federal Bank, ICICI Lombard, Himadri Speciality, CIE Automotive, Network 18, TV18 Broadcast, Samara Raja Batteries and Rallis India. While the only stock on our radar with negative news for today is LNT Tech. But let's also get a quick handle on what's happening in the world of commodities. Manisha Gupta is joining in for a roundup of all the action there. Manisha, what's been happening? Thank you for that, Sonia. Well, uh, we are looking at some support coming in for the industrial commodities. I'll start with crude, where the prices did gain 2% overnight. The markets are anticipating the U.S. inventories to show a decline. That is because the output has seen a decline, and also because this is a summer driving demand season. You could be looking at some support because of that as well. Also, China officials suggesting policy rollout to support local consumption is a positive to watch out for. The other sector, which has done quite well for itself, has been the precious metals. The gold prices surged to a 7 
four-week highs in the overnight market. This is after ECB has signaled a pause on rate hikes from the month of September. And we've seen the Canadian inflation numbers also come within that range. The street will watch out for further data coming in from Europe in this week itself. In the meanwhile, it also is about... Uh, uh, decline that we've seen in terms of production when it comes to gold and silver, that seems to be supporting as well. Okay, well, uh, Marisha, thanks very much uh, for that. That's commodities in focus. We'll take a very quick commercial break here. Devin Choksi will be with us uh, with uh, what he makes of some of these earnings which have come through to begin with and uh, what he likes in the market. We are back with that. We'll also have uh, the uh, CEO of uh, Healthcare Global Enterprises to discuss their expansion plans and the outlook as they see it. Stay with us. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Well, we wake up this morning with very strong cues. So let's put some of them on board, right? Uh, the global markets have been very strong. The Dow, in fact, ended up almost 
370 points higher yesterday. It's been the seventh straight day of gains and the longest winning streak since 2021. What's also happened in the U.S. markets is that uh, the earnings are off to a very great, uh, off to a good start rather, the Q2 earnings. So out of 38 companies of the S&P 500 that have already reported results, 82% have exceeded expectations. So that is aiding the market sentiment over there. In fact, Microsoft shares rallied to an all-time high overnight after the company announced pricing for its new AI subscription service. So there's lots that's been happening in the technology space as well. A couple of other things, uh, FII has bought over 2,100 crores in the cash markets yesterday. And now in July, so far, FIs have pumped in 15,000 crores. So let's get Devin Choksi of KR Choksi Securities into the conversation to tell us how he's feeling about individual stocks. Uh, Devin, hi, good morning. Uh, what do you do with Indus and Bank now? Very good set of numbers, net interest margins at an eight-year high. Um, is it still worth buying at this price? Hi, Sonia, good morning. Well, certainly, yes. I believe that I think most of these banks who have had the problem in the past regarding, I think, their books, regarding, I think, whatever the corrective actions had to be taken, including on strengthening of the capital. All those issues have been settled, I believe, and I think particularly for Indus and Bank. Uh, going forward, I think the bank probably should be seen from the point of view of uh, increasing the loan rate, the growth rate in the loan rather. I think that is more important from here onwards. At the same time, I think the newer verticals that they want to create uh, through the acquisition of RCAP, I believe that I think this is going to be uh, relatively, I think, a better opportunity for them. Uh, in the commercial vehicle vertical particularly, I think the company is, uh, I think, having relatively better time because we see the visibility of next three to five years, both for the fresh new vehicles as well as, I think, from the pre-used vehicles. In both areas, I probably see the companies having relatively better time as far as the loan growth is concerned. So uh, certainly, I think market price have gone up, but I think the corrective price uh, in the market, whenever it is available, should be a good buy opportunity to buy into in the scene, along with other corporate banks like Axis, ICICI, and of course, ITFC. Hi, Devin. Uh, good morning. Since we're talking about banks, what about Federal Bank? You know, they were talking about raising some money. Uh, they have done part of that by a preference issue, and they're also doing a QIP. So bulk of their fundraising plans will be done. Uh, how do you view the stock from year on? Last week, post its numbers, the stock did pull back a little bit because of a minor compression that we saw in NIMS. But they have indicated that going ahead, things still look up. Your view on it? So I think while fundamentally nothing wrong with the bank, and I say uh, the prospects as well, but more importantly, I think I would prefer to stay with the bigger bank, the larger banks, for a simple reason that when economy is picking up, the growth rate is assumed, I think, to be on the higher side in the economy. Companies with a larger ability to lend and a, a book size would probably be more preferred because for them, the cost of fund would be lower, cost of transaction also would be equally lower. And at the same time, I think the growth rate would be sustainable because of the higher amount of uh, credit offtake which is happening due to the growth in the economy. So I would rather prefer to stay with the larger banks because I think for them, the raw material is money. And if this money is available to them, probably uh, these banks are relatively better placed compared to uh, the smaller bank who would have to struggle. Not that they will not be able to expand the credit, but they will have to struggle. Vis-a-vis, -vis, I think the larger banks would probably have a natural growth because of their borrowers are equally large at this point of time. Uh, Devin, hi. Uh, good morning. Any thoughts on uh, LNT technology? Uh, which reported numbers. I mean, actually, LTIM, LNT technology, Tata LXC, all these uh, underwhelming numbers. So, Bashan, good morning. Well, I think on one side, uh, those numbers are slightly, I think, challenging at this point of time. But on the other side, I believe that I think these companies have relatively more amount of uh, growth prospect to talk about. They are, each of these names that you have mentioned, each one of them have been operating into the niche areas which I believe I think has brought them, uh, has given them the advantage of uh, working closer with their customers. So in mm -hmm. my viewpoint, even though the times are a little challenging, and maybe I think on a sequential basis uh, and also on a YOI basis, in some cases the growth rate is being seen a little moderated. But in my viewpoint, I think that is not taking away the larger prospects that they have. Maybe one or two quarters, I think they may probably find themselves back into higher amount of ordering back into the company. At the same time, I think the market needs to get adjusted for these companies largely because of the fact that valuations have been, I think, fairly priced in most of the mid-tier IT companies, including the names which we are discussing. I would believe that I think if the market corrects uh, with the, on the price and the time correction, 
probably i think these companies are relatively worth looking at once again back into the portfolio given the opportunity size on which they are working at this time okay uh, devin uh, we have reliance industries earnings coming out on friday and this time around the strength in the consumer business continues however uh, you know within the otc segment i think the refining margins are expected to see a dip so sort of a mixed bag this time around but the stock is up 30% from the lows we saw in the month of march how are you placed here um, do you think there are any positive triggers that can take the stock higher yes sonia so i think uh, two or three points from the consumer business point of view of course i think geo financial is positively running the clock at around 20% rate of growth which is fundamentally very very important and this is not counting in the new uh, geo phone services that they will launch which is geo bharat the quality test i believe that i think geo bharat in itself i think would have the ability to produce a revenue of about 25000 crores in a year to 15 months time from now and at the same time around 12 12 and a half thousand crore worth of ebita out of uh, this particular portfolio of activity mm -hmm. given the existing business and which i think they are having the higher amount of rpu targeted because of the larger data consumption at the same time mm -hmm. i would like to believe that i think geo uh, the existing current business would probably clock in about 1 lakh 20 thousand crore worth of turnover in financial year 23 24 and on that turnover i think somewhere around 60000 crore worth of ebita is i think distinctly possible so overall we are talking about uh, around 65 to 72000 worth of 72000 crore worth of ebita in this current financial year uh, and given the situation from geo uh, itself and retail platform particularly is growing at the rate of around 15% rate of growth plus and at the same time around 7 7 and 1/2% kind of ebita margin on the top of it so assuming that i think they would be crossing 3 lakh 20000 crore in the current financial year as far as mm -hmm. the top line is concerned probably i think they are talking about 21 to 25000 crore ebita from the result so you are right i think the consumer facing businesses are the ones which are uh, driving this particular stock and geo financial services which is getting demerge i think it's recorded today i would like to believe that i think that has a potential to give you the multi bagger return going forward from uh, the demerge entity so certainly i think the reliance i think all the verticals are probably seen doing very extremely well as far as i think investors concerned they will get appreciation i believe Okay, all right, uh, Devan. Uh, before we let you go, I wanted your view of the on the blockbuster result that we got yesterday from Polycap. You know, the last few quarters has just been surprising the trade, and one would say we don't want to touch real estate stocks or you know some of these other stocks, but this could be an indirect play out there. And the stock has done very, very well. But at current reckoning, what's your view? Well, I think uh, un undoubtedly the numbers are absolutely uh, spectacular numbers. I think, and uh, the wire and cable business particularly. where the company has recorded significantly large growth almost double kind of a growth that they have report, uh, reported is something which is inspiring a lot of uh, uh, confidence because the possibility has always been high and they have started clocking these numbers so from the perspective of looking at this company from investment yes i think one should stay invested of course i think valuations are at this point of time only fully priced as i believe or maybe fairly priced as one would like to call it as fn eg business in particular has lot of potential uh but i think that is not reporting enough amount of contribution at this point of time maybe they are in the building phase to a greater extent but i would like to believe that i think that business too eventually i think should start contributing and the portfolio will ultimately become balanced with our in cables business so one mm -hmm. could certainly look for an opportunity to buy the stock at a lower level if market gives correction at some point of time okay All right, uh, Devin. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in. Appreciate your Thank thoughts. You. Polycab has been one of the biggest gainers. It's doubled in the last one year, and of course, very good set of numbers as well. But let's do one thing. Let us uh, take, uh, you know, take some time off from discussing all of these stocks and speak to our first corporate of the on the show. Healthcare Global is consolidating its operations in Nagpur. The company is executing a share purchase agreement for acquisition of the entire equity share a capital of a cancer hospital in Nagpur. Uh, they had announced this but now they will be executing it bs ajay kumar the chairman and ceo at healthcare global enterprises joins us now to discuss more on this development uh, this deal has been done for 31 crore so they will be shelling that amount out um uh, mr ajay kumar thanks a lot for joining in can you give us a little more details on this i mean you had indicated this before but now you're you know sort of executing it can you give us what the timeline of the completion of this deal would be what are the reasons for this acquisition 
See, Nagpur is one of the important uh, centers for us. We started the cancer center partnering with uh, Dr. Mehta, uh, who is a surgical oncologist. And uh, the, what we have done is we have completed the acquisition of the cancer center where we were partners. We were a minority in the NCHRI before. Now we have become 100% owner. The only reason to do that is to, of course, uh, expand our uh, presence in Nagpur. And really, you know, this will help us financially, consolidation and operations. And Dr. Uh, Mehta has been a leading partner. With all this, we are completing this. We hope to finish this in the coming quarter, this quarter. We are just waiting mm. for some approvals. And most of okay. it is in place. So we should complete it in the next two months. All right. Uh, morning, uh, Doctor. Thanks so much for joining in. So you're clearly sounding a little bit optimistic on this uh, you know, vertical yeah. or this geography, that's the Nagpur geography. Give us a few more details. What's the bed capacity, occupancy out there? And I think the revenues were approximately 50, 51 crores or thereabouts. How do you see this scaling up in the time to come? Yeah, I think it is about, you know, 100 and close to 120 beds. Uh, we built a very big center there, one of the state-of-the-art center in Nagpur. And we think with this, uh, the expansion possibilities are there. We are bringing new technology in mm -hmm. here state-of-the-art radiation equipment, and also we are in the works to bring in robotic surgery. So what we want to do is, with the help of Dr. Ajay Mehta, make this one of the centers of excellence. As you know, Nagpur is in the center of the country. So it is very premier for us to do this and expand locally around, create a hub and spoke model around Nagpur. That is how we expect to grow in this region. Any other inorganic plans that you have, Mr. Ajay Kumar, and any kind of war chest, any amount that you have laid out for these uh, acquisitions over the next yeah. 12 to 18 months? Uh, yeah. We have declared in the last uh, meeting also, we are in the process of some uh, acquisitions, m and activity, but uh, mm -hmm. today I will not go into details. We are also in the silent period, but we hope to make some announcement in the next few months around some significant m and activity. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so can you tell us a little bit about this center itself? Uh, what is it doing in terms of, you know, occupancy levels? How much do you think the growth rate could be for the business over the next one year? See, just to take some parameters, our footfall has increased over 20-25%. Our occupancy rate is around 60% and we expect this to increase to about 70-80% as we grow. And the most important thing is our outpatients has increased significantly. In fact, our uh, linear accelerator is running to full capacity and we are also looking at installing the second linear accelerator you know, in the near future. And with the robotic surgery coming in and with the hub and spoke model, we have daycare centers which we will plan in the future. We expect a significant growth. Uh, you know, Nagpur. Nagpur has done very well if you look at the history in the last few years. And now with this consolidation, we'll be, as we have announced, We'll be adding additional EBITDA of nearly 7.5 crores to the, our uh, and, uh, our, our uh, system, which will be significant financial upside, I believe. Okay, all right. Seven and a half crores by when? Uh, once the consolidation be announced, once we get the necessary approval, it will add mm -hmm. to that. So we are hoping okay. in this. Okay, in this in this quarter, you said. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mr. Ajay Kumar, for joining in and giving us your quick thoughts. Uh, that's Healthcare Global with the latest uh, expansion plans uh, with the Nagpur Hospital. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side of the break, we will continue chatting about the markets. Expectations are that the market will open in the green today. Anuj will be joining in for a quick trade setup. Post that, we'll bring you the top stock picks of the day from our technical and FNO experts. Stay tuned.
<clears throat> okay, welcome back. Uh, you've got the market, which is going to open up in about 12 minutes, the pre-open, that is. Let's just uh, have the gift nifty rates uh, on your on our screens. Uh, that's suggestive of a uh, <clears throat> higher start, 27 odd point, higher start uh, for the uh, index. Well, uh, so it's uh, perhaps going to be a slow start. The tailwinds of the <laughs> global markets last night were up three quarters of a percent, both NASDAQ and S&P. Uh, so the handoff has been good. Anuj is here in the studios as always with uh, what he's watching out for. Anuj, good morning. Morning, uh, Prashant. Uh, well, uh, you know, I'll start with a couple of charts uh, if they're ready. Let's start with the FIA long positioning chart. Uh, we had, uh, you know, spoken about it uh, some time back. Uh, now let's revisit. Uh, and this is where the market had peaked out. This is where the market had bottomed out. Uh, and this is the FI uh, peak long position, FI peak short position. We are back to almost peak long positions. But you know what? Uh, this chart still does not worry me as much because uh, we're still at 70% long. At the bottom, we were 90% short. So we can get there. Absolutely nothing wrong in that. Uh, for the near-term traders, uh, what I'm watching out for is the options data. And in that, if you look at the Nifty options first, uh, now this is the Nifty call options. And what you will see here is that the call and put options, uh, 19,500 and 19,600 puts, they have the highest open interest. So that's obviously your big support. Uh, now, this is the this is the Burj Khalifa that we need to cross, basically. 19,800 call. We could not do it yesterday. That's where the resistance is. Uh, similar data for the Bank Nifty would come up now. Uh, and over there, you will see the support and resistance. Uh, look at that. This is the 45,500 call. Uh, uh, this is where you have uh, uh, the highest open interest. Uh, and of course, at 46,000. So those are obviously your resistance markers. Uh, uh, the texture, though, is one step back, three step forward. That's been the market's texture. Some resistance at 19,800. But my sense is that uh, 19,800, 20,000, there could be some consolidation that the market will again break out. Uh, uh, it's so overstretched, if you look at the moving averages, the current 5-day moving average is 19,612 and 10-day moving average is 19,466. So the best case scenario for the market would be if these moving averages catch up. And the way of doing that would be if the market consolidates and maybe corrects to 19,600 and the moving averages move up. Uh, and one last point, uh, why our market stands out, just look at the numbers. Yesterday, for example, from Indus in Bank, and Polycap. Polycap in particular, of course, came in market hours. Uh, but just tell you that, you know, why this market is rallying and this feeling that you get about this market being in the same parallel at, like 2003 to 2007, when consumption and finance both re did really well, I think we're going through something similar as far as the medium to long term texture is concerned. Okay, well, Anuj, uh, thanks a lot for that. So not too far away from that uh, 20,000 milestone, Mitesh Thakkar and Sudarshan Sukhani are joining us now to tell us how to approach the markets. Uh, gentlemen, morning to both of you. Sudarshan, this 19,800 hurdle, right? Is it something that can be taken out easily? And uh, what's the sense you're getting about how today could shape up? Uh, what could be the markers for the index? Yeah, good morning, Sonia. I would think the 19,000 hurdle is not really significant. It just happened to be there when the markets closed yesterday, that high was made. It will be taken out sooner or later, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. So I, I would not put much importance to it. The much bigger number I told you yesterday also was 20,000, which is a round number. So human nature by itself gets uh, you know attracted to the round numbers. And that will be interesting to see how long the Nifty spends time around 20,000. So we should go to 20,000, another 300 points very easily. Now, what should we do, do today? We could have a choppy market today. Uh, that choppiness should be used to buy on dips. For the Nifty, there is a single trade. Every intraday dip you see, you go long, you'll get that benefit tomorrow or day after. Carry the position. Don't get worried about small uh, down moves. Wherever you see a down move, just pick it up and be on the long side. Now, the bank nifty had a bad day yesterday. It, had, it rallied, then it closed at its lows. That should not deter us. The fact is that the bank nifty is also on the verge of a confirming breakout. It broke out but did not confirm that breakout. It should do that. So the bank nifty uh, is also a buying opportunity. Now we have this convergence. Both indices are ready for buying. So the trade is easy. Look for a dip and go long. Mm. Look for a dip and go long. Uh, <clears throat> uh, gentlemen, good morning. Mitesh, uh, what about you? How would you look at things? Good morning, Prashant. Uh, I think the uh, immediate trend clearly remains on the upside. And therefore, I think you know, there are two, two things to worry uh, for a trader. One, to find out what targets we can hit. I think 19,800 is a bottom pivot while it's been made yesterday. But the call over interest, which I was pointing out, is something which traders should factor in. 
and then beyond that 90 950 20000 is what i would look at one and on the uh, other side you need to look at a reversal point which you know below which you will want to at least exit long positions and see if the market can give uh, more space to buy at lower level so i think that is around 19 560 575 i think till that range holds declines would be buying opportunities but only if it breaks below 19 560 then i'll be worried uh, worried and then i'll you know uh, look at cutting down my long exposure Okay, what about individual stocks then, Amitesh? What would be on your list today? Yeah. <clears throat> Morning, Sonia. As of now, I have all uh, buy calls or uh, buy trades. Uh, so, very clearly trading with long bias. Uh, a buy or Aurobindo Pharma with a stop at 740 for targets of 780. Indalco is a buy with a stop below 439 half for targets of 458. And one more uh, aluminum stock, national aluminum features on my list. That's a buy with a stop at 91 for targets of 97.5. And one Conditional sell call, which is Britannia, if it breaks the pivot of 50-50, take a shot with a 50-100 kind of a stop and look for targets of around 49.50. Okay, pivot of 50-50. Nice one. Uh, good one, uh, Mitesh. Thanks for that. Uh, Sudarshan, coming across to you, what about your individual calls? Yeah, I'll just give you my individual calls. This time I have a question for Sonia. Sonia was there when the Nifty was at 2,500, 2,500, 2008, 2009. So, Sonia, did you at that time imagine that you will be talking about it at Nifty at 20,000? No, I did not. I promise you I didn't. And, you know, we were just discussing yesterday, Sudarshan, as to how we were wearing T-shirts when the Nifty hit, uh, when the Sensex hit 20,000, right? And today the Nifty is at 20,000. So, I mean, yeah, the journey has been long and it's been a great journey for retail investors, for market observers as well. So, no, I never thought this day would come. All right. So, here are my picks. Uh, Bada India is a. Uh, my point again is that you must be on the long side of the market. Don't get confused. Bata India is a buying opportunity. The stock is now consolidating, but in this consolidation, it should break on the upside. Buy with a stop under 1640. The only sell is Coal India. Coal India has a fairly choppy chart and it's been falling for six, seven days. It may have its own reasons. It's an intraday short with a stop above 232. Then I have Cummins. Cummins is a buy. Again, it's in a sideways range after a big up move. In, a, in an uptrend, sideways ranges break on the upside usually. So buy with a stop under 1875. And I also have ITC. You know, ITC is doing nothing for five days. It's actually gone into a huddle. Who knows? It may be ready for another breakout and taking the nifty along with it. So buy ITC with a stop under 465. Okay, ITC, look at that move, 60% in the last 12 months and trending higher. Let's do one thing, let's take a quick commercial break on that note. On the other side, we'll have the pre-opening rates expected to be quite strong. We'll also be joined by Peter Maguire, the CEO of Exem Australia, to discuss that spike that we saw in crude prices and the impact on commodity markets. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Hope you're having a good morning. Well, for starters, the implied opening is that we're going to start off in the green. So let's see how that goes. But for the time being, let's get you some derivative strategies. Uh, Rajesh Palvia, the VP Technical and Derivative Research Access Securities, joins us on the show. Hi, Rajesh. Good morning. Uh, fill us in with your derivative strategies for today. Uh, good morning, Nigel. So uh, overall, if you look at the market setup, it's on the bullish side only. Uh, we have witnessed uh, some bit of you know short covering again in the Nifty. Uh, but uh, Bank Nifty has uh, witnessed some uh, long and winding uh, setup uh, in the previous session. Looking at the overall uh, data setup, uh, Nifty is comfortably holding the put base of uh, 19,600 and 19,500, so which clearly indicates that you know minor dips uh, is uh, going to act as a good support area at uh, 19,650, 19,700. To play uh, uh, for this option. Uh, uh, expiry for this current week. Uh, we are initiating here short straddle strategy. Uh, so we are writing uh, 19,700 call put uh, to initiate this strategy as uh, we are getting almost 145 rupees premium for writing 19,700 call option and the 19,700 put option for current uh, weekly expiry for this op uh, for this uh, uh, 
uh, week. So uh, our break even on the higher side would be around 19,845 and on the downside uh, we are protected up to uh, 19,560 levels. So these two levels are very important for the market to uh, you know continue further more upside. So once we get the breakout above 19,845 then this really can accelerate but for this weekly expiry we are projecting that you know nifty is likely to expire around 19,750 so for writing uh, this call put uh, your stop loss should be around 175 and uh, uh, we are projecting target of uh, 65 rupees for this uh, short straddle strategy which we are initiating for 19,700 strike on the stocks front, uh, we expect uh, Alchem Lab can continue for the more upside. In the previous session, we have seen strong short covering action and looking at the uh, technical setup also, stock managed to view breakout of its previous swing high. So looking at the setup, uh, we are projecting target of uh, 3750, 3780 on the higher side and uh, keep a stop loss of 37, 3620. The another stock which we like for today's session is uh, Asian Pen and we are projecting target of 3600 keep your stop loss at uh, 34.95 and the third stock is uh, tata consumer again long built up was there in the previous session and almost a stock closed near today high and looking at the uh, near term setup we expect tata consumer can continue for the more upside and uh, we are projecting target of 890 to 895 uh, keep your stop loss at 842 all right uh, thanks a lot for joining and by the way the pre opening uh, rates are settling in right now and I'd want to take a look at what's happening with some of these names. Indusin Bank has been the big stock in focus. In pre-opening, Indusin Bank has rallied 4% after the profits came in. Uh, you know, at, the profits have been rising actually for 10 straight quarters for Indusin Bank. And the net interest margins at an 8-year high. So the street definitely likes that. Uh, that stock is up almost about 4-odd percent. Infosys is the other one. After bagging that $2 billion AI deal yesterday, Infosys has been piling on the weight uh, in its stock as well. So now almost approaching that 1500 mark on emphasis. Tech Mahindra LTI mine tree is coming back. So keep an eye out on that. But let's shift focus now on the commodity markets. Peter Maguire, the CEO at Exim Australia, is joining in to talk about oil prices and all things commodities. Peter, thanks a lot for joining in. You know, this morning oil prices are moving, inching a bit higher because of the uh, China economic support pledge and tighter supply across the globe as well, but still a little below the $80 per barrel mark. Do you think this could be the pivot, $80 a barrel on Brent for a while, or do you see the range shift a bit? Well, good morning, Sonia. A couple of things. I think it's had a nice rally to the upside. Also, take into mind where the US dollars traded over the last week or so, and I wouldn't be surprised to see another leg up from here. So we're seeing a little bit of resistance around that 80 to 81 bucks, but I think uh, there'll be further momentum to the upside. And uh, I keep a close eye on US dollar and uh, let's see what happens as far as geopolitically uh, what's happening across the globe at the moment. So, yeah, I think it's going to be some interesting times ahead for crude oil. Upside risk, uh, Peter. Hope you had a good day out there, you know, in Australia. Uh, you could tell us, but what could that upside be? You see, go back towards ninety dollars. Well, might just well do, Nigel. I'm not suggesting you're going to be there soon, but I, over this uh, summer period in the northern hemisphere, I wouldn't be surprised to take a ninety handle out. I think that there's overall um, the overall consensus is across the market, and many analysts are saying that it's very achievable over the over the next couple of months. So. Uh, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at it, it's hard to forecast, but I think there's more bullishness than bearishness at the moment. Mm, okay, so in terms of a range, what are we looking at, say, for the next uh, say 12 months on crude? What do you estimate the floor and the ceiling could be now? Well, I think, you know, Sonia, that's a big, that's a big range as far as 12 months. So let's say a 70 is a low side, and I think it's probably got the potential to be a $90 plus on the high side. So that for 12 months is an enormous window as far as time because we're coming into an election year next year. You're coming into uh, OPEC and their thoughts, Saudi production, Russia. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, components to this big thing that we call crude oil. All right. Uh, well, since we have you with us, Peter, you're clearly sounding quite bullish on crude. But what about the other metals? What's the preference out there between ferrous and non-ferrous? How do you see pricing shape up and any particular commodity that you're bullish on? Well, I had a look at copper. I'm keeping an eye on that. And naturally, some of the you know base metals, uh, I, I just think that it's come back a little bit. We've given up some of that hot air from 8,800 back to about 8,700. 
So oh, 8,400, I should say. So uh, some of that's come off. A couple of the other medals are interesting to note. I'm keeping a close eye naturally as an Australian on, on uh, iron ore. And mm. one that I need to look at certainly is gold and silver because they've had a strong push to the upside. You've got gold sitting there at 1980 an ounce and you've got silver over $25 an ounce. So, yeah, they've had a nice push up and maybe there's further expansion on both of those in the short term. So copper and precious metals, both of them could, uh, you know, is something that you're a little bit more optimistic on. But Peter, what are you building in with regard to China? Everyone's talking about a stimulus. Do you think a stimulus is coming? And uh, if you have any kind of quantum that we should be looking at? Well, I can't put a number on it, but I th certainly think, Nigel, that there will be stimulus and I think it'll be quite aggressive. So it'll, it'll help their market, it'll help the internal demand, it'll help the overall picture across mm. China. So there's the first part of it. The second part is you probably see more consumption. You need to see stronger consumption externally, you know, across the world to buy those finished goods. But there could be a very big push to the upside as far as internal demand. And uh, we all understand, you know, it's a huge growth engine. So it's demand for it'll be insatiable for commodities. And I think that's probably a good sign for miners and anyone that provides uh, anything to China. Okay, China stimulus perhaps coming. Uh, thanks a lot, Peter, for joining in and uh, giving us updates on the commodity markets. But let's get back to our own markets now. Looks like it's going to be a pretty solid start. 50 points in the green on the Nifty and very close to that uh, 19,800 mark. So that's been a bit of a hurdle for a while. Let's see if we can get past that. Apart from Indusin Bank, which is your big mover, Federal Bank is the other one. Remember, IFC will be investing a little under 1,000 crores into the bank via the preferential allotment route. So Federal Bank is up in the green. Sudarshan Sukhani is back with us. Uh, Sudarshan, what's the big call at 9.10? Well, I would buy Cummins at uh, uh, with a stop under 18.75. Right, and uh, Mitesh, with... what about you? I'll go to buy on uh, National Aluminium with a stop at 91 for targets of 97. All right, uh, gentlemen, uh, thanks very much. <clears throat> Those are 19 calls coming through. There is seven minutes to go for the market open. The pre-open is indicating a good 50-point bump uh, right at the word go. So that is good to see. And uh, the rupee is starting up as well. Uh, so, better than what I think we uh, expected early on uh, with a 50-point uh, gap up. Well, let's uh, get the standout brokerage reports. So what should move on the back of, uh, you know, what analysts are writing or have written this morning? Nimesh is here with that. Nimesh, morning. Hi, Mani Prashant. Sir. Today's standout is on power sector stocks. Uh, Goldman has uh, initiated coverage on a couple of names. So, they have initiated with, with a buy rating on NTPC with a target price of 265 a potential 40% upside from current levels. They have also initiated coverage on SJVN with a target price of 55 and interestingly a sell uh, you know, on Tata Power with a target price of 190, a potential 15% uh, fall from current levels. Now on NTPC, uh, Goldman Sachs believes that uh, uh, NTPC will emerge as a, as a winner in the renewables energy transition as the structural cost uh, be benefits of low, low debt uh, will, be, will provide a strong mode. Additionally, uh, the rising peak uh, shortages will rewrite the legacy thermal business. So that's the reason why they like NTPC. On SJVN, uh, they like the exponential growth in the RE business targets backed by low cost of debt. In fact, in the medium term, uh, they believe that the growth, uh, the earnings growth will, will improve on the back of commissioning of the two large plants. So that's the reason why they like SJVN as well. And they believe the further rewriting can come from the hydro, hydro projects as well. On, th on, and on uh, Tata Power, uh, the sell call is essentially because they believe that the, that the medium term growth prospects are, are going to be lower and uh, on the back of uh, you know, glo uh, global thermal costs going down. And also the earnings are going to be a bit challenged as well. Also, uh, you know, the RE projects of, the, of Tata Power are not going to see uh, large commissioning going forward. So that's the reason why they have a sell on, on, uh, on Tata Power. But two initiating coverage with the buy rating, that is NTPC and SJVN. Nimish, uh, on SJVN, is this uh, the first kind of foreign brokerage which has come out with coverage? I remember CLSA initiating coverage on NHPC, another one of those power stocks sometime back. On SJVN, is Goldman the first? Uh, not really, Pishan. Even, uh, even CLSA has a target, has, has a coverage on SJVN as well. And even they have a buy rating, if I remember correctly, even they have okay. a target price of close to 53 or 54. So uh, I think th this could be the potentially a second large brokerage, FI brokerage, covering on uh, SJVN. All right, Nimesh, thanks a lot for that. Well, we have about five minutes left for the markets to open. Let's go across to Abhishek. He's going to talk about what could be the biggest stock of the morning, Indus and Bank. Abhishek, over to you.
Uh, well, Sonia, it's an absolute serene results from uh, Indusind Bank. The balance sheet uh, risk is at the lowest in the last seven years or even more. So what has been good in the uh, last few quarters is that for 10 quarters in a row, their operating profit is growing both YOY and quarter on quarter. The net interest margin of uh, Q1 is at 4.29%, which is perhaps the highest that you are seeing in the last eight years or even more. RWA, that is risk weight asset to advances ratio at about 111%, is perhaps at a seven-year low. The the annualized slippage ratio of about 1.9% is the lowest in last 11 quarters and gross NPA ratio of 1.94% and net NPA ratio of 0.58% are the lowest in last 10 quarters. Now brokerages uh, remain bullish on the stock. They say that the outlook remains healthy, steady buildup continues in top line and operating profits and valuations are attractive on a one year forward basis. Retail deposits are doing well. So across brokerages largely you are seeing an increase in the target price. So target price ranges from as low as 1,250 to as high as 1,800 per share. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Abhishek, you said it. Very, very good set of numbers uh, as per your analysis from the board go itself. Uh, let's hop across to Vivek. He's here to tell us about it. Uh, uh, you know, I think HSBC has initiated coverage out there. Vivek? Well, good morning. You know, that's right. So what's actually happened is that Titaga Rail Systems, HSBC has initiated coverage. Uh, they have a buy stance on the stock now and the target price is quite lofty at 730 rupees a share. What they're saying is that as far as Titaga is concerned, they are actually expecting the EPS to more than double over the next, you know, three years. And what they're saying is that the company would be able to deliver a high teens return on equity. Uh, the uh, company would benefit from India's plans or the government's plans to go ahead and put more freight on its rails, providing a compelling opportunity for Titagar as per HSBC. Also, what they're saying is that the company, which is also a leading maker of freight wagons, is now an emerging champion as far as the patch passenger coach business is concerned. So what they're saying is that a two and a half per times jump in profit over FI23 to FI26 with an average ROE of almost 18% and an even more diversified business will hold Titagar in good stead going forward. All right, uh, Vivek, thanks very much uh, for that. Let's uh, circle back to l &T Tech, which we highlighted as part of our top 10 list. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I think, earnings disappointed as Rima was telling us. Rima, take it away. Uh, so the miss is coming on the top line. The company has delivered a top line growth of 9.8% below consensus expectations. In the current quarter, the comp company had done an acquisition of SWC. But even if you strip that out, the organic revenue growth at 0.6% is much lower than consensus expectations. Despite a soft start to the year, the company has held on to its full year guidance of a 20% top line growth, which includes 10% due to the acquisition and 10% organic. But analysts believe that after a weak Q1, this looks quite difficult for them to achieve. So Morgan Stanley, which is an underweight rating on l and technology, says that the revenue guidance could be at risk given the high ask rate over Q2 and Q4. And they're also concerned about the valuations of l and tech. Nomura, too, has a reduced rating on the stock. They believe the 20% revenue target is lofty. Uh, the management's rationale for holding on to the guidance is that in Q1, there was decision-making delay. But the decision-making improved in the month of June and July, which is why they're quite confident that Q2 will improve. There will be some acceleration in growth compared to Q1. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Rima, for that. So we have the market opening, which is upon us. I think just about 15, 20 seconds left. Looks like it's going to be another good opening for the market. Remember, the Nifty is just 250 points away from that 20,000 mark. The uptrend has been intact. Global queues have been very strong. So there's nothing really that the market should be nervous about this morning. All eyes will be on the opening tick in 10 seconds from now. Good earnings coming through from the likes of Indusind Bank as well. Uh, today you have names like Canfin Homes, l &T Finance that will be reporting their numbers. So a lot of individual stocks in focus. But there we go. Here's the first tick on the index. Well in the green actually, 60 points higher now on the Nifty, up at that 19,800 perch. So let's see whether we can conquer that, uh, you know, conclusively. The first uh, mover, of course, on the upside is Indusind Bank, the biggest mover rather. 3% higher post its numbers, followed by NTPC. Infosys has been gaining ground. In fact, this month, Infosys is now up 12%, so it's been a pretty uh, strong rally. Tech Mahindra, Wipro, LTI, Mindtree, the whole IT pack is, you know, up almost 1 to 1.5%. Apart from that, uh, autos are not doing too badly. Tata Motors is up about half a percent. Bajaj Auto is in the green right now. Uh, Britannia, Bajaj Finance, Kotak Mahindra Bank, HDFC Bank. Let's take one glance at the bank Nifty. 
It's looking pretty solid, so 180 points in the green for the Bank Nifty, up almost about four tenths of a percent. The advanced decline ratio is also very healthy this morning, almost 1560 stocks on the advancing side. So let's see what's dragging the markets lower. It's pharma. So Dr. Reddy, Sun Pharma, uh, a, a tad bit in the red, Sipla in the red, and then some of the FMCG names. Nestle is down about half a percent. Then you have Bharti Airtel, Axis Bank, Hindalco, LNT, just a little soft, nothing alarming. But otherwise, very, very strong market. Now we are holding on to 19,800 with all our might and, uh, you know, piling on the weight. By the way, the Sensex, so we're talking about the Nifty at 20,000. The Sensex is inching closer to 70,000, I mean, just 3,000 points away. So, you know, pretty stellar. Absolutely, Sonia. And, you know, the stock that's building on to gains that we saw yesterday is Polycap. It was up uh, in yesterday's trading session. It's up close to around 3%. You won't have to wait too long. In the next 15 minutes, we'll be joined by the management. So it's building on gains on the back of a good set of numbers. Havels taking a cue actually from Polycap since those numbers are pretty good. The street is building in that maybe Havels as well will not disappoint. So let's see how that goes. And yesterday we had UBS as well that was quite bullish out there. So that one's up close to around 2%. Those are the notable gainers from the FNO stocks. LTTS, well, the revenue growth was a miss. The stock started off with a cut of around a percent. It's quickly moved into the green, though. Stock is up close to around a percent or thereabouts. A couple of other smaller names that came out with their numbers, Himadri Chemicals. The EBITDA number was up more than 50%. You had margins as well that expanded to around 14%. Or so that's up 2.5%. CIE Automotive, the EBITDA number was up close to around 20%. Revenues as well up close to around 5%. There was margin expansion out there. So that one as well comes up for you on the screen. BL Kasha, we don't talk about it very often, but they bagged an order worth 370 crores from DLF Home Developer. So that stock's up and about in today's trading session. And Delta Corp, uh, yesterday the stock rallied on hopes that maybe there'll be a relook into this GST, 28% GST that'll be imposed on them. Maybe, in fact, those uh, you know hopes are fading a little bit or maybe some routine profit-taking. Post the 5% up move yesterday, the stock's given back close to around 2% odd. But not a bad opening, holding about that 19,800 mark. Good start, uh, Nigel, as you said. I mean, this is uh, 60 points, nothing to scoff at after yesterday's quieter kind of session. We are at, what, 8, 19,800 plus on the index. Uh, Polycab is the one, as Nigel mentioned, which is, uh, you know, it <clears throat> ended uh, with a big 5 6% gain yesterday. Almost all of it coming after the results came out, and it's adding more. I mean, uh, what a ride it has had uh, all the way from, uh, <clears throat> you know, actually the last, what, two and a half, three years or so, uh, the lows of uh, 2020, one of the best performers since then. Uh, CIE, we mentioned, what else? Uh, Nimesh was talking about NTPC with that, uh, you know, call coming in from, I think, Goldman, 2% higher, 191. Uh, Sare Gama, we've heard some chatter around Sare Gama over the last couple of days, 2.5% higher, 459. Uh, KEI, 3% higher. Again, it's one of those huge winners, KEI Industries. Uh, stocks at about 2,500 as we speak. There is a Schneider, which is up about 3.5%. Pyramal Pharma crossed the three-digit mark recently. It's up to about 102, 103 rupees. SJVN was another one, which was part of Nimesh's standout. That's up another two. That's up two and a half percent, 47. Uh, NCC is up about two percent or so as well. But volumes are. I mean, I don't want to go, go down the list because volumes are uh, a little lacking. Delta moved a little bit. I mean, there was those uh, those tweets from Rajiv Chandrasekhar. There was an interview to our sister network as well, where they said that they'll try and go back and relook at the tax uh, changes which have been made. But at least they'll propose it. Uh, Delta is was, was up four yesterday. It's down one and a half percent this morning. Uh, and uh, ICICI Pru and ICICI Lombard both are down. Both are kind of they both reported subpar, underwhelming uh, numbers rather. We'll have the management by the way. ICICI Lombard join on, join in in about thirty minutes uh, from now. But our market master of the day is with us, Gautam Srivedi, co-founder and managing partner at Napian Capital. Uh, <clears throat> Gautam, great to have you with us here. Thanks very much. Good morning. Uh, you know, we are uh, in uncharted uh, territory in that sense with new highs. Uh, is there, will we, I mean, somebody I was talking to was saying that typically what happens is once you cross these big levels, you add another, you know, 10, 15% before uh, you should start to think about fading moves in any significant way. Would you kind of agree with that? Or you think, uh, you know, a lot, is, a lot is priced in now? You know, here's the thing, the Indian markets as well as the global markets have been driven primarily by an avalanche of uh, liquidity. And in India's case specifically, it's more foreign-led, uh, especially since uh, the last four months. Uh, I mean, global markets basically are, have been on fire uh, year to date. So we've seen about $6 trillion of uh, uh, market cap addition this year alone. 
So clearly, uh, it seems that the investors have forgotten about or just gotten tired of waiting for that uh, ever elusive US recession and have just plowed back into, into, into the equity markets. So if I look around the world, you're looking at uh, the MSCI Emerging Market Index, which is up 9%, but the MSCI Developed Market is up uh, double that, 18%. NASDAQ's up 40, 43%. Uh, uh, the CAC, the Nikkei, and the DAX are all at lifetime highs. So I think mm. it's so much to do with liquidity and to try and forecast when that will slow down or taper off is very, very difficult at this point of time. If you look at just in the last 12 weeks in India alone, we've seen a cumulative $15 billion of net uh, FPI inflows. So I think uh, uh, the quantum of money that's coming in to India at this point is massive. And bear one more thing in mind, that our valuation is exactly that, i.e. Nifty 50's valuation at 18 and a half times, calendar 24, is exactly the same as the S&P 500. So in spite of that, foreigners are finding value in the Indian market versus uh, their home market. So uh, Gautam, hi, good morning. What do you do in a market morning. like India now? Uh, you know, where do you see some kind of alpha generation? I know it's very hard at the moment, but do you think technology stocks are coming back in a big way, so it's better to jump in there? Any new spaces that you like, or, you know, for the next 12 to 18 months? No, I think, uh, Samia, you make a fair point about uh, the Indian uh, uh, IT space. Uh, you've seen, I think, uh, between uh, mid-Feb and mid-May, uh, the Indian IT, uh, the Nifty IT index uh, fell as much as 15%, but it's bounced back uh, over 17% since, so it's regained uh, all of its uh, loss. Uh, TCS, TCS is up 8% since, uh, Infi is up 14%. And I think the rally, to a great extent, has been caused by the likelihood of a either no, either zero U.S. recession or a milder U.S. recession. I mean, just to put things in context, I was uh, in the U.S. in the month of May, and there were literally no signs of any recession. Inflation was raging, is very sticky. Uh, a cup of coffee, uh, six dollars for a latte. Uh, locals said we've never paid that much for a coffee in our in, in our lives. Uh, the cost of a uh, uh, Uber ride from Midtown Manhattan to uh, Newark Airport was a hundred dollars. I mean, you know, this is serious inflation, and no one's no one's seen this before in in the history of America. So I think these are issues that uh, uh, clearly don't uh, suggest any sort of a looming recession in the U.S. And if that's indeed the case, uh, I guess the bet people are taking on the IT stocks is maybe the worst is priced in. In fiat twenty times, I don't think is really a bad bet uh, at this point. So that's. To answer your question, I think IT certainly come back because of that. I think banks still remain, you know, great. Uh, they're not expensive. Uh, we we continue to like that space, uh, and I'm, of course, have a bias for the private sector banks. But if you look at uh, RBS half yearly uh, financial stability report, uh, gross NPLs are now down to a 10-year low of 3.9 percent. Net NPAs are even lower at 1 percent. So clearly, uh, you know, banks are well capitalized. So I would continue to look at. Uh, banks as well. And on the emerging sectors, I think uh, 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 the EMS companies, and now there are you know, more than eight of them uh, that are listed. So there's a white choice, and I'm sure there are more coming uh, that will get listed over the next uh, uh, 12 to 18 months. But I think that's a space to watch out for. That's going to be increasingly uh, an area that's going to drive uh, productivity, it's going to drive you know, job gains in this country. Hi, Gautam. Good morning. Uh, Gautam, any morning. fresh, uh, uh, you know, sectors that you'll have increased your allocation out there? I recall, you know, Bharti Airtel was a stock that you liked from the telecom space. You're talking, uh, you're quite, you're sounding quite confident on both IT as well as banks. Anything new that yeah. you'll have added, uh, you know, say in the last couple of months since we last spoke? Sure. Uh, you know, uh, we haven't bought uh, Bharti Airtel. I think that was, that was more a response to the question you'd asked specifically because it's the only real listed play as of now. Geo's okay. not listed, and uh, Vodafone, of course, uh, you know it's it's a, it's a crapshoot if that's going to survive. But uh, an MTNL, uh, I guess, the government's thrown in the towel. So Bharti is the only one that's really left standing uh, from a listed play in the way to play the uh, mobile uh, telecom play. But having said that, uh, I think the EMS companies, is what we uh, like, as I just mentioned, uh, there's going to be huge uh, potential there. Defense companies finally, I think, are, are getting their. Uh, uh, space in the sun. Uh, of course, a lot of it, a lot of those orders are going to uh, public sector uh, defense companies, but I think uh, more of the private uh, uh, companies will also start to benefit. So I think that's that's an area. 
and that's clearly driven by the prime minister. So, you know, to, to, to and this is a promise which I remember talking to even in LNT about uh, eight, nine years ago, they had built up the whole infrastructure and were waiting for defense orders, which never really came. But finally, I think that's starting to happen. So I think defense would be an area to focus on as well. <clears throat> uh, got that. Look at Polycab. Uh, you know, we were talking about that uh, earlier. Four and a quarter percent higher on Polycab. Stocks at about 4,300. Uh, the management joins us in about uh, five minutes or so. Got them many thoughts on this one. Polycab. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there is there is a, a huge resurgence in the real estate space. And poly, a company like Polycab and any, anybody's sort of within the building material space is going to usually benefit, whether it's the ceramic companies, whether it's uh, companies like Polycab or even the Bajaj Electricals, companies like that will uh, uh, usually benefit. So I think uh, I'm kind of glad in some sense real estate's made a, finally a comeback after eight years of uh, really doing not much. So I think, yeah, Polycab would be, we don't own it, uh, but we don't, you know, we, we think this could be an interesting company. Uh, you don't own it, uh, but are there, I mean, is this space something where there's still more earnings and valuation upside? I'm asking because, you know, stocks like Polycab have more than doubled in the last one year, right? These are well identified yeah. names. So do you think there's yeah. any juice left here? Um, and if not, what does one do? Uh, see, the thing is, the mid cap space, unfortunately, uh, has run up way ahead of its. I guess fundamentals and some of these valuations are very, very high. I agree with you. I, I would wait for a correction and I hope there is one uh, in the market, I think, overall. And if that were to happen, I think I'd focus on, on names like Polycap or some of the ceramic companies. Mm. You know, given the current valuations and the current setup, uh, Gautam, uh, what did your yeah. asset allocation strategy be? You know, maybe the markets were expensive a month or so ago, but it's still higher. Yeah. And there's. Uh, there's a high possibility that we move up a little bit from year on as well. But at current juncture, what would it be? You know, if you had to allocate to say real estate, uh, bonds as well, yeah. fixed income and equities. So, you know, I think if you take a cue from what uh, the domestic mutual funds have been doing, this month, i.e. this literally this month in the month of July, they've sold over a billion dollars. If you look at retail investors uh, in terms of their liquidity and their preference of investing more into the equity markets, for the last four months, they've been continuous sellers. So if I look at this fiscal year, uh, and I have the data as of the end of uh, June, uh, domestic investors, retail investors who invest directly into the market, they're a negative 21,000 crores of selling. So that clearly tells you that uh, people are looking at alternatives like uh, a fixed income because uh, yields have clearly gone up. Uh, you're getting a Sridham transport, a Sridham finance rather, uh, you know, yielding you anywhere from nine and a half to ten percent. So I think uh, mm. these are all pre-tax numbers. So I think the fact is there are alternatives to to equities emerging finally, and of course, people who book profits uh, in the equity markets are buying real estate. Okay, you know, but... Gautam, you mentioned this even the last time about fixed income, yeah. but uh, you know, if, uh, logically, that's it's uh, you know, it'll be good to take some allocation out there. But the markets, I mean, mid caps, small caps, large caps, everything have moved up from the. I think we, you mentioned a similar point uh, in April or May odd, but from there we're still yeah. higher. So it's a very tricky situation, I think, for investors out there. It is. It, it certainly is. So I think, uh, but I think the fact that if it's four consecutive months of selling by retail investors uh, gives you a sense of you know where, what they're thinking, and it probably find the market too expensive at this point. Okay. Uh, just uh, one more word. Uh, okay, all right. We have actually run out of time, Gautam. Thanks a lot for joining sure. us and uh, taking us through your views. Well, you know, the stock of the moment undoubtedly is Polycab. It's a 5% rally now on that stock, 70% higher uh, for the year. And uh, definitely, I mean, in the last one year, as I was mentioning, it's been a doubling of the stock. Very good numbers. Revenue surge 42%, while margins have also expanded. Gandharva Tongia, who's the executive director and chief financial officer at Polycab India, joins us now to talk more about that. Uh, Gandharva, thanks a lot for joining in. It's a, been a stellar quarter for you. So I want to first start by asking you what the volume growth has been in this quarter in the cables and wires business. And what kind of volume growth are you penciling in for the full year of FY24, given that demand has come back in a big way? Thank you so much for having us. Uh, this was the best ever first quarter performance of the company in its history. We did almost 3,900 crore rupees of top line. 90% uh, of that comes from cable and wire, where the volume growth is ranging between 50% to 60%. And in terms of value, it is around 
in mid 40s um we started working on project leap uh, almost two years back and there were several strategic initiatives which we have implemented under project leap in last uh, seven eight quarters and what volume growth we are witnessing now is in a way outcome of those initiatives plus the spend which is there by government both central and state and private capex which has improved in the recent past we believe uh, as part of project leap we should be able to get to 20000 crore rupees of top line by fiscal 26 and it's quite possible that uh, two three quarters down the line we recalibrate that guidance and uh, advance uh, the mm. term of 2026 to a period which is going to be sooner than 2026 so this 50 to 60 percent volume growth that you said in the cables and wires business that is for uh, this quarter right the uh, q1 yes and q1 what is the expectation of the last year. Okay, got it. And what is the expectation for the full year? What kind of growth are you looking at on the volume? So, as part of Project Leap, uh, when we started working on this five-year transformation, we had annual number of around 9,000 crore rupees in fiscal 21. And uh, we uh, set a target of 20,000 crore rupees by fiscal 26. By fiscal 23, we had already achieved a top line of 14,000 crore rupees. So we should be able to get to 20,000 crore rupees certainly by FI26, or it's quite possible that we are able to do it sooner than FI26. I won't be able to give you a quarterly guidance because we don't generally give quarterly guidance. Okay, all right. Uh, well, Mr. Tongia, first of all, congratulations on a solid set of numbers. Uh, you know, the last few quarters when we've spoken, you've been talking about this 20,000 crores odd, and now you're indicating maybe it comes a little bit sooner as well. So we'll stay tuned to that for the coming years. But another big highlight of your numbers was the margins. You know, if I focus on the largest part of your business, which is cables and wires itself, you have been guiding for around 11 to 13 percent. But this quarter, it's coming at around 15 percent. Is it a one-off? Would you like to revise that guidance, Hayam? And also in terms of a blended margin, that as well is coming at around 14 percent. So I want your guidance on both these two numbers going ahead from here. So we have 90% uh, of business, which is cable and wire, where we have, uh, uh, in a way, two type of businesses. One is a B2B cable business, which generally anywhere between 9 to 11% EBITDA margin, and the wires business, which is in mid-teens. Uh, whenever there is a favorable uh, shift towards wires business or B2C business, our blended margins are better. We believe on a sustainable basis in cable and wire, we can target a number between 12 to 14% EBITDA margin. Uh, coming to the balance, 10% FMEG, it is still slightly softer, but we are taking a strategic initiatives and we believe we should be able to comfortably get to 10% of EBITDA margin in FMEG by 26. All right, just a quick uh, counter question. So now it appears that on the cables and wires business from around level to 13%, you're up there to around 12 to 14%. So the band has moved up a little bit. Talking about the FMEG business, uh, you know, what's the number that we should look at out there? In which quarter does it move back into the black? That's profitability. And also, what kind of growth are you looking at in this particular vertical? The smaller part of the business, 10%. Directionally, we want to be uh, uh, in top three companies in which our business uh, we have presence. Uh, in FMEG, we have uh, businesses like uh, fan and lighting. We also have presence as switches and switch gear and uh, retail wires. Retail wires, we are already a market leader. For other businesses, we are taking initiatives to get to top three over the period. In terms of the margins improvement, we believe in the subsequent quarter, the current fiscal itself, we should be able to get to better numbers. And as I mentioned a while back, by fiscal 26, we should be able to get to 10% of EBITDA But that's very margin. far away. That's very far away, Mr. Dongya. I want to know in the near term, uh, which quarter do you get into profitability and what is the growth you're looking at for this year, FY24 itself? Yeah, that's an interesting one. And as you know, we as a company, we don't give quarterly guidance. Uh, what I can certainly highlight to you is that over the period, uh, quarter after quarter, you should see improvement in the margins, uh, generally speaking, on FMEG space. And very comfortably, we should be able to get to 10% of F uh, EBITDA margin in FMEG by fiscal 26. Mm. Mr. Tongia, uh, good morning uh, and congratulations, strong set. Uh, I have a few questions on numbers, but I just want to uh, wrap up that uh, the 90% the of the business cables and wires. Uh, you've given us the numbers uh, there, but uh, what's happening in the market? I mean, uh, you're doing very well. Just want to understand the drivers. Demand is strong, but, uh, you know, is what's competition doing? Are, are you, how are you gaining? Uh, you seem to be gaining share as well. So just qualitatively, what's going on? 
So let me give you two, three highlights. Uh, let me talk about the uh, domestic business and then I'll come to international business in a while. As far as domestic business is concerned, we are known for our quality and availability. We have the largest manufacturing facility uh, and we have all the SKUs, uh, which one can think of on cable and wire side. It includes uh, power, data, special cable. Uh, there's a robust uh, demand, both from private as well as government side. Uh, you would have already noticed that uh, central government has taken initiative to utilize the budgets, which they have earmarked for infrastructure and other development uh, projects. And most of it is what they are trying to utilize by December, which is also resulting into a better demand environment for government. On the private side, most of the listed companies have announced uh, CapEx. Many of the companies have uh, uh, reported better order books, and they are also trying to implement projects at a rate which is slightly better than what they used to in earlier period. And that macro is converting into a better uh, demand environment for us because we have the best in class facility. We are known for quality. We have almost 4,500 dealers and distributors. And whenever there is a demand, we are able to uh, quickly supply. As part of Project Lead, what we did in last two years is we have revisited our GTM. Uh, there were few dealers and distributors who are not necessarily playing uh, the best game. We have supported them. We have improved okay. our processes. Uh, earlier, we used to take, for example, uh, 3x of the current time what we are taking in terms of TAT, uh, in terms of giving, uh, you know, quotation. And we are using digital in a very meaningful manner. So there's a combination of several initiatives which have helped us in improving our domestic market share. On international side, uh, which contributes almost 10% to our top line, we are working both on distribution. We have presence in countries like US, Australia, mm -hmm. Spain, mm -hmm. and we are also working with the EPC large players and we are regular suppliers for them. Okay. Mr. Tungia, uh, <clears throat> got that. So that's a lot of uh, changes and improvements that you're making. Just uh, now coming back to some numbers, uh, the cash conversion cycle has uh, gone up uh, for you by uh, some 27 days. It's now at about 73 days of sales at the end of the June quarter. Inventory has uh, gone up by about 550 crores to 82 days of sales. This was 62 uh, at the end of the previous March quarter. Uh, could you tell us what uh, happened and uh, you know, guide us on both these uh, matrices? Sure. So we are the largest consumer of copper in the country, and almost mm -hmm. all of it is imported from uh, international suppliers. Two of the large smelters were uh, planning to go for a shutdown uh, as part of their annual maintenance, and that is the reason why we have upped our inventory levels of copper. Uh, this is uh, momentary. Uh, I think it's a matter of a quarter or two, and after that, we should be able to go back to our regular working capital cycle, which is generally between 50 mm -hmm. to 60 days. Okay. I have a couple of questions for you before I move to uh, Mr. Inder Jaisinghani, who is the Chairman and Managing Director of the company. He's joining in now as well. Mr. Jaisinghani, welcome to the show. I'll just come to you in a bit. But before that, I wanted to complete the conversation with Mr. Tongia as well. Uh, Mr. Tongia, you earlier said that you will achieve 20,000 crores revenues by FY26. Can you give us a slightly near-term target by the end of FY24? What will the revenue growth be? Earlier, I think you had mentioned you will do 15% revenue growth by the end of FY24. Would you want to scale that guidance up? Uh, as I mentioned a while back, uh, we won't be able to give you annual guidance, uh, but I can give you a bit of a color. We believe we would continue to provide industry leading growth and that number has to be in double digit. And it's quite possible that in few quarters from now, we come back and uh, recalibrate that 20,000 crore rupees guidance, which was uh, due by FY26. Okay. okay. And on the CAPEX front, can you give me a number as well? I mean, you had guided for six, 700 crores of CAPEX for the full year. How much have you spent already? And given that demand is so strong, right? I mean, 50-60% growth in volumes is not a joke. Would you want to scale your CAPEX higher? As of now, we are continuing the same guidance of around 600 crore rupees, 500 to 600 crore rupees. Uh, we are going to use it for uh, setting up EHV facility uh, for some exports units and a bit of a capex in the form of uh, maintenance, uh, as well as for uh, FMEG. Uh, we don't need to necessarily up the guidance at this stage. Okay, all right. Uh, well, uh, let's get in Mr. Jason Ghani as well into the conversation. Well, sir, I wanted to ask you a two-part question. One is, uh, you know, Mr. Tongia has been talking to us and sounding so optimistic about the way you all are growing. Have you all gained market share? Point number one, if you could tell us uh, that. Are you outgrowing the market? And point number two, on exports, the current contribution is around 9%. What do you end this year with? I think last year exports was close to around 1,380 crores odd. 
the market, we will gain at least 2% more in this year. Okay. And we are building a capacity because export requires huge quantities and the big markets. So we are uh, adding the capex and putting a new factory for that. And uh, demand is good. We can, in future, at least be doing 17 to 18% continuously for export market. Okay, so you're saying export contribution from 9% this year will move up to around 11%, the 2 percentage point increase, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, right. And later on, you'll look at mid teens in terms of contribution from the exports, right? Yeah, yeah. Is, is this EPC driven? No, it is not EPC driven. It's a pure oh, so market okay. supply to EPC big contactors of the world who okay. are taking contact with the Korean and Japanese and Americans and uh, Spanish a lot of contact are there, which we are dealing with them, and we are supplying to them. Okay. And what about on the domestic front, market share gain? Was that evident? Have you outgrown the market? Yeah, this time we have market gain is around about 1.5%. More we are taking now. And we are basically looking for a best supply chain and logistic, how to reach no. to the customer, and how to rotate fastest material on the distributor. And we are looking for that. Okay, uh, Mr. Jaisinghani and Mr. Tongia, thanks a lot for joining in. Appreciate your time here and the kind of you know wealth that you have created for investors. All the best for the future. That's Polycap, one of the biggest stocks this year and in the last many years. Of course, 20,000 crore revenue is their target by FY26. And they talk about how demand has been very, very strong. Uh, but let's do one thing. Let us, uh, there's, by the way, some news on BKG. They've acquired 49% stake in 396 CCDs uh, in uh, Bhujia Lalji, okay, I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, so that's, uh, some, that's another stock in focus, 4% higher now. Let's do one thing, let's take a quick break. The market is also uh, very, very strong, about 60 points higher on the Nifty and 200 points on the Sensex. When we come back, we'll connect with Sriram Vela Yudhan of IFL Securities to discuss about the geo-financial demerger. Later, we'll be joined by Gopal Balachandran, the Chief Financial and Risk Officer at ICICI Lombard General Insurance. Okay, welcome back. Uh, you know, we've got the market, which is uh, just kind of uh, nicely uh, coming along. 55 points, 19,800 or so is where we are at. Now, as we've been highlighting uh, for the last, uh, you know, day, two days, is uh, that the big corporate event uh, is tomorrow, I mean, uh, for the markets, which is the demerger of geofinancial services out of Reliance Industries. Tomorrow is the record date. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, there are implications. One, of course, is how this is going to happen because, you know, the framework under which this demerger is going to take place is new, relatively new. Uh, the, you know, the, the framework was introduced, I think, uh, in uh, as recently as April of this year. So there's a pre-opened session which will happen tomorrow uh, in which the price discovery will happen and then uh, Geo Financial, which is, which is the new entity, will be part of the uh, indices which NSC has specified, including the Nifty 50. We explained that. Let's actually uh, talk to uh, an expert and try and understand if there are, first of all, any trades or opportunities around this event. Uh, and then we'll talk about what next. Sriram uh, uh, Velayudhan is Vice President, Alternate Research at IFL Securities. He's with us on the phone line. Sriram, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much. Uh, so just that question uh, to you. Uh, you know, in the near term, in terms of the listed uh, price universe, for the stock or for the market, are there any, are there any trading opportunities? Uh, good morning, Prashant. Uh, uh, so, yeah. So, today is the last day for uh, buying uh, Reliance Industries if, uh, like, you know, someone wants to have the uh, uh, benefit of demerger entitlement. In terms of interest, yes. Uh, so, so in terms of interest, uh, uh, we are seeing decent uh, uh, queries in, in, in terms of the uh, potential value unlocking uh, Reliance Industries uh, Geo Financial Services can offer. Uh, so we pegged the value of uh, JFS as at a two and a half times price to book and assigning a 20% uh, Holco discount to the value of RIL 
uh, investments in GFS roughly turns out to be uh, 205 to 210 rupees. Hmm. Yes, in terms of interest, we are seeing decent interest today. Being okay. the last, would you would you, uh, would you would you would uh, you would you recommend? Uh, uh, I mean, if people those who don't already own Reliance to uh, buy it uh, to be able to to be eligible to uh, be allotted JFS shares. We don't know the listing. I mean, you know, by the time by then the listing happens, we would have had the AGM. We would perhaps have heard more about plans of Reliance for geo financial services, etc. Uh, because right now the value which is being ascribed is only the value of its uh, holding in Reliance Industries. But obviously the value will be much higher as we hear more about what the plans are. Go on, Sriram. Uh, Prashant, I would uh, like, you know, refrain from, I am not an expert in uh, fundamental domain. I okay. uh, uh, go towards, right. better towards alternative and the quantitative side. Right. Uh, I would hmm. uh, refrain from giving a formal uh, recommendation. Right. But in terms of value unlocking, uh, yeah. investors are keen on exploring this uh, special situation. Because it is not right. that often that we uh, end up getting back-to-back -back, uh, liquid situations in a span of a week. Last week it was HDFC, HDFC hmm. Bank merger, and this week it's Reliance. All right. Hi, Sriram. Good morning. Sriram, I wanted to ask you, you know, we're aware about uh, the Indian indices, how we'll be treating uh, the company. We'll have 51 stocks in the Nifty and 31 stocks in the Sensex. But what about global indices? How will they treat Reliance Industries as well as Reliance uh, Geo Financial Services, uh, both MSCI and FTSE? Yeah, good morning, Nigel. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, treatment in MSCI India and FTSE, MSCI, uh, to the best of our knowledge, has come out with a communication that uh, in terms of uh, the market cap criteria and all, uh, geo financial services uh, uh, fulfills the float and full market cri uh, cap criteria to get uh, added in the uh, uh, standard index under the last cap bucket. To start with, starting tomorrow, it will start as a detached unit. And as and when it receives all the approvals uh, on the day of listing, it will get uh, added as cap constituent. In terms of FTSE, the FTSE framework states that, uh, let's say, if a demerged unit does not get listed within 20 business days post the record date, then FTSE, ideally, like you know, uh, uh, deletes, the, uh, deletes the unit. Uh, mm. In this case, geo financial services. So we will have to monitor the uh, the days uh, required for JFS to get listed. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot, Shriram, for joining in and uh, you know telling us uh, uh, you know more about the demerger and how shareholders should approach it. By the way, the markets continue to do very well, so don't lose sight of that. Still, six, sixty points higher. But ICICI Lombard is in focus after their Q1 earnings. The premium growth was in line with estimates, while the profits was below expectations, although their motor own damage loss ratio has improved sequentially. So let's start with that. Gopal Balachandra, the Chief Financial Officer and the Chief Risk Officer at ICICI Lombard is with us. Uh, Gopal, thanks a lot for joining in. Your loss ratio in the motor OD segment has definitely improved this time. Can you tell us what are the kind of pricing trends that you're seeing in the motor segment and what is the outlook for the full year? Yeah, so good morning, Shonia, and that's a uh, that's a great question. Uh, so honestly, if you ask us, uh, motor definitely is a preferred segment for us, and uh, that's been one of the competitive segment uh, where the market has been very very aggressive, uh, particularly since the last uh, couple of years. We are seeing some early signs of green shoots play out for the market when you look at, let's say, for example, the combined ratios that's available for the overall market for the last year, which is FI twenty three. The first half combined for the industry was 124. The second half combined improved to about 118. Uh, this is for the overall market. So this, while the combined issue still continues to remain elevated, from our standpoint, I think we have been a bit guarded in, in kind of driving the motor book. But having said that, I think we are kind of putting uh, across board in terms of small amount of price increases in some of the select segments of uh, vehicles. Equally, we are kind of putting a lot of emphasis in so far as uh, claim service is concerned. And that's the reason why you find the loss ratios within our acceptable range for ICC Lombard. But having said that, I would always urge that uh, it is better to look at numbers more on annual basis rather than looking at on a quarter on quarter uh, cycle. Hmm. Mr. Balachandran, hi, good morning. Uh, Prashant here. Uh, I'll come back to some of what you said, but just a here and now kind of question. Uh, the top of mind question for many is, 
what is the uh, sort of risk of rise in claims because of the flooding that we've seen, sir, uh, for a general insurer like you? Could you put some some estimate? I'm sure that you would have uh, you would have some idea if you can uh, tell us in the ballpark. No, absolutely. Good morning, Prashant. Uh, so I think uh, as a part of the Q1 numbers, if you would have seen, we had let's say the cyclone Bipur Joy, which had an impact. Uh, we had roughly about 380 claims uh, on account of that particular event. The net impact of those claims, which was there in our PNL, is close to about 35 crores. The good news is what I was kind of referring to. I think if, as a company, from an ICC Lombard standpoint, we have always kind of focused a lot on claim service. So of the claims that have already got reported for Cyclone Bipur Joy, almost more than 70% of those claims have already been settled. So hence, there is a continued thrust and focus on uh, making sure that I was talking about I was talking about the claim, the flooding impact now. I mean, in I'm the north, that as well. in, in the second quarter, well. which will come up in second quarter, I'm assuming. Go on. I'm coming to that as well. I think so. One is the event that we have seen for Cyclone Bipur Joy in Q1. Q2, I think early trends, I think still the claims are kind of trickling in. Uh, as of now, the number of claims that we have seen is exactly on the same count as what we had seen for Cyclone Bipur Joy, which is roughly at about 350, 360 claims. But again, early days, we honestly will have to wait for a few more uh, days to kind of play out as and when the claims will start kind of trickling in. Uh, as of now, the kind of impact that we are seeing on the net is not a significant uh, uh, quantum. But honestly, we will wait for further clarity to emerge once we see maybe over the next, I would say, a week or two when we will start seeing more number of claims getting reported. All right. Uh, hi, good morning, Gopal. Uh, you know, on health, retail health has grown by close to around 20%, which is pretty good. How much of that was price led? So, Nigel, again, good morning. Uh, so, for us, uh, it's a combination of both. Uh, we did a price increase on the renewal book uh, of almost about 19%. This was in February 23. Uh, the other part is, I think, on retail health as a segment is, a, some, is where we have been kind of looking at uh, making continued investments in adding more headcount, which is our own employees who are, who are kind of working on the health agency distribution who in turn kind of look out for more number of agents to be added. So it's been a combination of both. As I said, on the renewal book, we had affected a price increase of almost about 19%. That, that's in February. And uh, two, the growth is also aided by the increased investments that we have been doing on building that particular segment, both of which has led to an improvement in the overall growth of that particular segment, which is better than the industry growth of 18%. So earlier, I think you had mentioned that you're looking at a premium growth in excess of 15% for FY24. Uh, do you stay, are you, you know, on track to achieve that or have you changed your guidance in any way? So, Sonia, honestly, I think if you look at, uh, let's say, uh, in general, the thought process for us is uh, we have all, we have got all the levers which will kind of aid to drive growth, whether you see distribution, investment in technology and claim service. Our thought process always has been that uh, through these levers, we would want to kind of continue to outgrow the market, which is what we have seen in the first quarter of this year. We have had an outperformance of almost close to 100, 100 basis points. The similar kind of a thought process is what we have even for the rest of the year, uh, because the market clearly presents an opportunity across segments, whether you look at motor, health, or commercial lines. And therefore, we are rightly positioned to capture this opportunity. So the way we would look for is to try and see if we can have, continue to have that 100 to 200 basis point uh, growth better than the market growth numbers, rather than specifically looking at a pointed uh, point estimates in terms of growth uh, percentages. Uh, no, but ballpark, I mean, since you're saying that health is a key focus area for the company uh, and you've done about, uh, you know, 20% uh, growth in retail health this time, is that a number that you can sustain? Can you do better than that? And overall, what are you looking at for the full year? Yeah, so let me kind of break that into each of the segments, as you rightly mentioned. So if you look at uh, health, uh, health as a segment, we have kind of grown at almost about 40%. Industry growth has been at about 20%. Now, will that trajectory continue? Honestly, for the rest of the quarters, Q1 is generally more skewed for corporate health. The rest of the quarters is relatively more kind of reflective of retail health growth numbers. There, we have seen a growth of almost about 23% for quarter one. That's something that we should definitely kind of sustain even if we look, look forward to the rest of the year on the retail health space. On the commercial lines, which kind of spans across fire, marine, engineering, liability, etc., etc., there again, if you would have seen for Q1, we have had almost a 2x growth. Industry grew roughly at about 8%. We grew at almost about 17%. Now, that's been a segment where over years we have continued to kind of accrete market share. And given the increased thrust that the government is also putting on infrastructure investments, which kind of significantly aids the engineering line of business, we should definitely see the growth momentum sustaining. Having said that, one 
segment of the business within the commercial line space has been the fire insurance, which as we had explained even in the earlier call, from this year onwards, there has been some impact of uh, price change. So for example, in quarter one, there has been a price drop of almost about close to six to 7% for the overall market. So that segment will continue to be possibly a little tepid in terms of growth, but overall for ICS alone, but for the rest of the year, we should continue to see the growth percentages that we have seen for Q1. On motor, again, the trend line seems to be kind of looking quite uh, positive for us. Again, when you look at sequentially month on month between April, May and June, we have been able to see improved growth numbers. But one thing that we'll watch out for is the change in the expense of management guidelines that has come into force from this year. A lot of the players in the market are operating at a threshold which is much higher. For ICS Lombard, that expense of management is well within the threshold. Once players start to course correct, their expense of management numbers, that by itself will further present op further opportunity of growth for us. Hence, for the full of full year, I would continue to maintain that the industry should continue to grow in the range of 15 to 20% in that range. For ISIS Lombard, we would look for, as I said, 100 to 200 basis points over and above the market growth numbers. All right. Uh, Gopal, you had given us a, a number for the industry uh, combined ratio which has come down a little bit, which is good. For your own combined ratio was impacted because of the 35 crores uh, of the cyclone, right? Uh, going ahead, when do you see that 102% off that you have been telling us about in the past? So, Nigel, what we have been telling the market is, uh, I mean, we ended FI23 with a combined of roughly about 104%. We have been saying that by end of FI25 is when we would want to see that combined ratio down to about 102%. And directionally, I think uh, when we kind of see ourselves getting placed, we believe we should be able to kind of uh, achieve that. So as of now, no particular changes to that uh, number of 102% that we have talked about to reach by end of FI25. Okay, uh, we'll leave it there, Mr. Balachandran. Uh, thank you very much and uh, hope uh, we are able to speak with you soon again, maybe in a, a few weeks' time once you have, as you said, I mean, the claims for... Uh, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, flooding uh, which start to come in uh, and uh, that will only happen once things actually settle down, uh, which should be a few weeks from now, hopefully. Uh, thank you very much. That's ICS Lombard uh, for you. We'll, uh, you. We're up uh, 90 points, by the way. This is uh, looking super, super strong now, at least on the index. Uh, so we're at the day's high, by the way, uh, which uh, this is, uh, you know, with what, uh, 40 minutes of trade behind us. Let's just look at the Nifty Bank as well before we go any further. Nifty Bank is up a third of a percent. So, you know, not very much there. Uh, the small cap index, which saw some pain yesterday, is reversing right back. It was down about 1%. It's uh, back up almost 1% or so in uh, trade uh, at uh, this point in time. What else in terms of movers? Polycap is still there with a 4% uh, gain. Uh, Havels is up a 3% or so. Havels, there was a dubious call yesterday. Uh, stock did sell off from the high point, but uh, this morning is strong. TV18 broadcast, of course, uh, disclosure that uh, you know, it's the parent company, 9% uh, higher on TV and broadcast. Talks at about, what, 43. Uh, big volumes, by the, by the way, on that one. Angel One, we highlighted this, I think, on Monday morning. Stock uh, sold off 15 16% in two days uh, flat. It's recovering. It's up uh, 4% or so. I think it didn't quite get to the 200-day, uh, but got close to it. So Angel One at about 15 17 or so. Uh, Sterling and Wilson Solar is up about 6%. It's, it did very well day before yesterday. KEI is up uh, 5%. Titagard was one of the stocks which uh, Vivek highlighted in the morning that HSBC called. Stocks up 5%, 568. So there is more into the mix now as the days uh, kind of uh, uh, gone on. Let's get in Mitesh with a quick check on things. Mitesh, hi, good morning again. Uh, you know, comment on, if you will, strong surge, uh, reacceleration in that sense. Uh, on the Nifty, if you have any trades and uh, what would you... Uh, trade in terms of stocks. Prashant, uh, good thing I think you know that uh, one we managed to get past yesterday's high and uh, uh, on an hourly chart we had to tap up. So I think if somebody wants to buy afresh, while we have targets of 19950, I think the stop loss would be slightly mildly deep. I would say uh, keep it at about uh, levels of uh, 19770, so about 70 points risk and 110 120 point kind of a profit is possible. So in that sense, it's not a very uh, good risk reward issue. So maybe you would want to buy it on an intraday dip, but otherwise, I think that's the levels which people can uh, watch. And 19.770 also becomes a trading stop loss. Uh, right, on the uh, stock 19, side, uh, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, all right, 19.770. Got that on the Nifty. Uh, Mitesh, I wanted to ask you about the Nifty Bank. 
We had pointed this out earlier in the show as well. July 4th, it went almost, you know, to this 45,700 odd. Yesterday, we went to 45,900. It appears this 46,000 mark could be a bit of a resistance zone for the Nifty Bank. How are you reading it? So, uh, on the Nifty Bank, you know, uh, I, 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 I would agree with the levels, Nigel, which you've discussed. I think 45,950, 4,600 is also an extension target. So, I think that becomes an important resistance. But I think the structure mm -hmm. on the is quite positive. So, I think we should at okay. least, uh, you know, uh, today or tomorrow attempt that level. And if we cross that, then we'll look at further high, uh, uh, further upsides. And on the okay. stock side, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Granules is a buy disclaimer. We have recommended this to our clients with some vested interest, but it's given a breakout uh, on the uh, charts. So it's a buy with a stop at 308 for targets of 335. And Voltas is another one that's something which I like as well. It's given a good intraday move. Buy here with a stop at 770 for targets of 805. Okay, Voltas, that's up to 1.5%. By the way, the Nifty PSU Bank Index is uh, the one that's surging now. So it's at the high point of trade. Just take a look at that chart. And one of the stock on my radar right now is Canfin Homes. It is uh, at a fresh 52-week high. The company comes out with its numbers later in the afternoon. Return ratios have improved. Asset quality has improved in the last in the preceding quarters, I'm saying. Uh, so this quarter, the expectation is that positive trend perhaps can continue. Uh, Mitesh, thanks a lot for joining in. Let's dip into a quick break. On the other side, Manisha Gupta will put focus on the commodity markets. Also, we'll talk about some stocks that are on the move. Stay tuned.
Okay, let's shift focus now to the commodity markets. Equity markets are doing great, but what's the one commodity that you should be looking at today? Manisha Gupta is here to tell us more. Manisha, over to you. Thank you for that, Sonia. Well, the commodity markets have opened on a positive note today, but I'm keeping my focus on the crude oil prices because we've seen stronger gains come in for this one as well. 2% in the overnight markets. It seems to be consolidating at this point right now. It's inches away from that $80 a barrel mark on your screens there. The markets have seen support ahead of the U.S. inventory data that comes in today with an expectation that you are perhaps looking at a decline in U.S. inventories. We have seen in the recent days decline in gasoline and distillate inventories because the demand has been surging and that clearly has been supportive. Apart from that, it is also about the Chinese officials suggesting that you could be looking at stronger stimulus measures coming in. I mean, we have been hearing those statements for some time now, but with every data that comes in on the weaker side, the hope clearly increases and that has been supportive. This time around, whatever the China uh, you know, surge comes in would be on the consumption side, recovery and push for that. And that's what the street is depending on. Russia also says that they would be planning to further trim oil exports by 2.1 million barrels per day in the third quarter. So that would also take the surplus crude from the market there. Apart from that, the dollar index yet again trading at a 15-month lows clearly has been a supportive factor. So has been the fact that the U.S. retail sales data has come in on the softer side and that tells you that the inflation seems to be easing and the interest rate hikes in the rest of the year may not be so great. But it's not just the crude oil prices. The natural gas prices gained up by 5% in the overnight market. There are projections that you could be looking at further heat waves continuing in Europe. The U.S. and Canada also are looking at higher temperatures. The air conditioning demand has been on the higher side. There has been higher gas production in US as well on a month-on-month -month basis. But with the way that the demand is picking up and inventories have seen a decline, there could be some more support that you could see in the energy basket there. This is what we've done on a month-on-month -month basis, Leah, really, in case of many of those energy markets there. So the crude oil prices are up by nearly 6%. We've seen natural gas prices gain up. Even gasoline and heating oil prices have gained up anywhere between 6 to 7%. So good going as far as the energy as a sector goes. Okay, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. Well, let's go across to Nimesh now to find out what the standout brokerage report of the day is. Nimesh, over to you. Hi, Sonia. So, uh, you know, as I said in the morning as well, the standout report today was on uh, power sector stocks. Essentially, Goldman has initiated coverage on, on, on few names. The first one is NTPC. They have a buy rating with a target price of 265, a potential 42% uh, upside, and that's the reason why the stock is also buzzing at a 5%. The second stock that they have initiated coverage with a buy rating is SJVN. That stock is up 6% on the back of that note. And uh, Goldman has a, has a target price of uh, 55 rupees on SJVN. And the third stock is uh, Tata Power. There they have a sell rating with a target price of 190. Now coming to NTPC, why Goldman likes this company and why they've initiated with a buy rating. Uh, essentially, they believe that NTPC will emerge uh, as a winner in the renewable energy space uh, and uh, on the back of the structural cost uh, advantage of low, uh, low debt, uh, uh, which provides a uh, good mode for the company. Additionally, uh, they believe that uh, rising peak uh, shortages will re-rate its thermal power business. So that's the two reasons why uh, they uh, they like NTPC. On SJVN, uh, Goldman believes that it's it's like, uh, you know, they like the exponential RE growth uh, backed by low cost of debt. Secondly, uh, the medium-term growth prospects looks very strong on the back of commissioning of the two large plants, uh, uh, which, which is likely to come soon. And uh, materially, which will have an impact on the earnings as well going forward. So that's the reason why they're bullish on SJVN as well. On, uh, on uh, Tata Power for the sell rating, uh, they believe that uh, the uh, earnings are going to be a bit challenging given that the global coal prices have fallen and they believe that the potential uh, you know, monetization of RE business is largely done in FY23. So there could be no further growth, at least in the medium term, on the RE side. So a sell on Tata Power, but uh, big buy ratings on both NTPC and SGBN. And that's the reason why both the stocks are buzzing into today. All right. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Nimesh, uh, for that. So uh, clearly, that seems to be the sector of the day. Titagard uh, Rail Systems, let's just revisit that as well. We highlighted this as part of our uh, 9 a.m. stock watch. Vivek is here with that one. Vivek. Well, that's right. So Titagard Rail Systems, today HSBC has initiated coverage on the stock, uh, has kept the target price quite lofty, 730 rupees a share. You know, what they are saying is that uh, the company is going to be a clear beneficiary of India's plan to go ahead and put more freight on its rails, providing a compelling opportunity for the company. What they're saying is that they're expecting the EPS to more than double over the next three years uh, with a high teens return on equity that the company could enjoy. Uh, remember, the company is the leading maker of freight wagons and an emerging champion as far as the passenger coach 
approach, business as well as concern. So what they're saying is they're forecasting a two and a half times jump in profit from FY23 to FY26 at an average ROE of over 18%. And the more diversified businesses that the company is incubating is something that is going to hold them in good stead. The back of that, you know, the stock is buzzing in today's trading session. All right, thanks a lot, Vivek, for that. Well, the markets continue to be at record highs. The Sensex standing tall above that 67,000 mark. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, our special segment is the economy. Lata will get chatting with Neelkan Mishra, the chief economist at Axis Bank and head of global research at Axis Capital to put focus on India's macroeconomic outlook.